Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 339 for Monday, March 7th, 2022. folks and welcome back or welcome to gig gab the show by for and about working musicians sponsors for this episode include bandzoogle.com where you get to try it free for 30 days and our promo code gig gab then saves you 15 percent off the first year of any subscription we'll talk more about why you're going to want to do that uh, a little later in the episode for now here back here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in napomo california it's paul kent how are things in napomo my friend it's a nice day today. How are things where you are? It's actually a nice day. It, like yesterday, it it was one of those weird, but but somewhat typical sort of late winter, early spring New England days where the day started cold and, and you know, cold, I say, like in the 30s or maybe early, low 40s. And then by afternoon, it was in the 60s. It was freaking great. Mm. Yeah. Lisa and I happened to be in Boston for this event or whatever, mid-afternoon. And we decided to walk outside afterwards and like go get some food. We're like, well, it, it, it's a short walk. Maybe it's okay. We don't, we left our coats in the car. And I was like, wait, it's gorgeous outside. outside. <laughs> like we, we don't want to go to a restaurant. We want to find like street tacos and just walk around Boston. <laughs> so That's great. it was, yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it's just how it works. And it reminds me of how this time of year I'll have one of those days. And then it makes me look forward to going to South by Southwest because that's typically, I mean, the weather in Austin is, you know, generally much warmer than it is here in New Hampshire. But also, like, the week of South by Southwest is often the first week for Austin where they see, you know, glimpses of summer weather, uh, you know, temperatures in the 80s and that sort of thing. And and so I... Uh, I, I made all my travel plans. I figured, heck, I had COVID six weeks ago. I'm in this, you know, it's a honeymoon period here of being, you know, having both natural and artificial uh, inoculation and immunity and all that stuff. So to heck with it. I'm taking advantage of it. I'm going to gonna go to South by and also go to podcast movement out in L.A. So it'll be a little crazy since those two yeah. weeks are back to back. But yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So and you just got back from. Uh Going to a warm climate to see some good music, right? Uh, yeah, as I as I've been telling people, the people are like, "How was Mexico?" I'm like, "Well, you know, I don't know how Mexico was. I know that I was at a resort with Mexican weather, uh, seeing concerts because we Mexico were gets credit for Mexican weather. You know that, right? I they as well they should. It's fantastic <laughs> what they've done with the weather there. But you know, we really didn't spend time in Mexico. Mexico, we were just at a resort, kind of in the bubble there. But it was it was fantastic. It was really great being able to just chill for five or six days. And um, I, I did learn a a well, I learned a lesson 10 years ago, but it, it came home to roost on uh, a week ago today. In fact, a friend of mine who travels all the time, he's a pilot, advised me to keep ciproflaxin in my travel case. He says it's the best thing for food poisoning, man. And, and it just, you know, having a few of those with you. Uh, can can really put, sort of change the nature of a trip. And sure enough, Sunday night, uh, you know, and this was, I mean, this was our fourth time doing this in Mexico with yeah. fish. We'd never had problems with food. I mean, it's a resort, right? They 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 process their own, they have their own water treatment plants at these places. It's, you know, it's right. crazy, right? But whatever happened, happened. And I fought a, a an heroic gastrointestinal battle uh, into the wee hours of Monday morning until I remembered, wait a minute, I have Cipro with me. And it had been sitting in my travel case for 10 years. And so I took one in literally within 90 minutes. I was, I wasn't a hundred percent. It took a couple of days to get, you know, hundred percent, but, uh, but I was back like 90%. Uh, thank goodness. And so it kind of saved our last day there. <laughs> thank goodness yeah, for that. That's great. So yeah, it was, it was good advice. I, you know, I'm not a big fan of, of just randomly taking antibiotics. And obviously I kept these in my travel bag for 10 years without even thinking about them. But, um, but in that moment, uh, I was a big fan. So, uh, you know, but I'm not a doctor, although they did let me write a prescription for more ciproflax in, in Mexico. So maybe I'm a doctor now. I don't know. You are in, in your Mexican doctor. Okay. 
Yeah, they, they, they're prescription pads down there, these square yellow things that have a sticky on the back of them. So that's, seen those. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I I'm wrote. I'm a doctor. You're a doctor. Yeah. Two hours yeah. later, it was delivered to the resort for me. So, Amazing. hey, I have a question for you. So, so sure. I'm thinking about you having a good time on the, on the sand with fish. Have you ever, have you ever had a band that did like a band retreat or, or purposely went somewhere cool as a band and, like a working vacation. Uh, yes, I've done it a few times. That I, I mean, it, 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 for folks who listen out there, and if you have anything to say, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I'm just going to start right there. But um, we often prep topics, and then those sit on a list, and then one of us will just have a thought and ask the other a question. That's what happened here. So I, I did not have any time to prepare an answer other than what you are hearing as I vamp right now. So two of these things come to mind. I'm sure, in fact, it's possible, greatly possible, that there have been more in my history. But, but I can think of two in recent history. The most recent one, working backwards, was uh, the bitter pill retreat that we did here, in, sure. l- literally in the room that I'm in. That was a travel retreat for everyone except me. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was a, you know. Where did let- they stay? Uh, they stayed in hotels. Uh, Mike and Emily stayed in a hotel uh, nearby. The rest of the people actually stayed at home because they're fairly close. But it was a, you know, thou shalt carve out your weekend schedule and and you will be, you know, we will all be here. We made that commitment to each other. And so it was it was a, a detached weekend, I, it, which is a trick when you're at home, you know, in your environments. And, and so but, but it but it did work and it was fantastic. Uh, we did it with Fling, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. We did a couple of nights away. Uh, we went to the vacation home of one of our bandmates. Uh, he, it's, it's usually like an Airbnb or whatever. He, you know, he rents it out. Yeah. It's, it's, in, it's on the coast of Maine. And so, nice. but, but yeah, he carved it out for a weekend for us. We all went. We stayed there. We just hung out. We played some music. Uh, but it was just band weekend and, and we were all just focused on each other kind of thing for the, you know, for the two days that we did that. And, yeah. and then, you know, like, I mean, I'm thinking with go figure, which was the original band I was in in college that did pretty well. We had, we had a couple of like touring weekends. If you, if you'd call them that where we had a gig far away. So we traveled and sort of hung out for the weekend. It wasn't a working weekend in terms of, like, I mean, we worked at the gigs, but the rest of the time was just sort of downtime, you know, between gigs. It wasn't, all right, now let's go sit and hole up in a room and, and you know, write songs or, or work on songs or whatever. But, yeah. um, but you know, even that, the camaraderie, the, you know, shared crisis of travel, we'll call it. <laughs> uh, yeah. All, all, all very much bonding things. Yeah. The concept of a band retreat is really attractive to me and, and for a few reasons. One is... I don't know about you, but adult guys who have a band, yes, I look forward to rehearsal. I think most guys look forward to rehearsal. But, you know, for some of my guys, it's at the end of a long day of work. Yes. And for some of those guys, it's their long day of work. They've been on their instrument all day long. So it's just a couple more hours on their instrument, right? Fair. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, there's there's families to get back to and, you know, it, rehearsal time, at least to my experience, is not terribly Zen time. It is work time. You know, we, we have stuff to accomplish. I have my list. We have stuff to polish up. Yeah, but there's a deadline at the end of it. And, and yes. there, those, those, those threads that exist at that deadline are pulling on everyone throughout. Yes. Yeah. So rehearsal is a, a, a task oriented thing. My band has never, we've, in our, all our time together, I think we've got two um, gigs up at Lake Tahoe, which would be one of the one sure. of the resorty areas driving distance that you might go to. Um, uh, but I, whatever happened at the time, I think they were in and out type things, and I don't know that you know. I think they only paid for one night's hotel or something like that. Four hour drive. So uh, I've I've heard of bands like there's a good band in our area called Extra Large, who the singer and his wife, uh, who's also in the band. They started a process of trying to move to um, some part of Baja, California, years and years ago, building a house over the course of a long period of time. And I think it, over the course of that time, they made friends, they got to know the local bars, those types of things, and they were able to you know, get their band down 
for semi regular nice work working. Yeah, that sounds that sounds really fun to me. Uh, it it sounds like a good thing. Another you know good friend of mine's band, the Cocktail Monkeys. I just heard about them doing an Airbnb up in up in Napa, you know, for a band retreat where yep. they're going to talk about new material, work on new material, talk about band stuff. I mean, just you know, get away and take care of all the stuff you really don't you don't have a chance to have a good social. You know, and I think yeah. about, you know, how much of our band's business is transacted on Slack. It's not a replacement for having everybody together. And again, usually when we call a band meeting, it's because some pressing thing, you know, has to be addressed. And, you know, there's all sorts of emotion that comes to this. And we've had, you know, these episodes where we talk about those band meetings where, you know, we need everybody to speak up and some do and sure. some don't, you know, those yeah. are business that's, meetings that are, that's that are way different hard. than just hanging out for days hanging. on end together. Yeah. 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 And I think about like, go figure, which I mean, we were in college for that ish. Uh, but you know, life distractions were far less plentiful than they are now, you know, 30 years later or whatever. So, like we had a lot of that sort of like when we got to rehearsal, it was, that was it. You know, we would generally rehearse on Sunday afternoons, uh, which made sense only because some guys would like go home for the weekend or whatever. And so we, you know, sort of come back early on Sundays and, and hang for the afternoon. And it was it, but it was hours, you know, six to eight hours or whatever we'd have together. And we'd play for most of it. But we were also just hanging out. We'd get dinner together, cook dinner, maybe, you know, whatever it was. We were, you know, somewhat broke college students that also were broke musicians. So, you know, we kind of had it going on two, two fronts, but we'd just hang. And, and even those rehearsals were far more immersive than a typical rehearsal that I would attend these days. Like a typical rehearsal, like you, like you said, even if it's, you know, a meeting, a rehearsal, there's a, there's a work plan. You're going to get there. You're going to like do what you need to do. And then everybody goes off to the craziness of their, their lives. That wasn't the case back then. And that's, and that, but I mean, that's just a function of our lives. It's not a function of what decade it was. It's what decade it was based on what decade you were born in. <laughs> I think it's really the function of that. So, yeah. It I, kind of brings up an interesting question about like, how much do you, how much do you think about the care and feeding of your band? Like, you know, mm. I, I think anybody listening would say philosophically, that sounds like a good thing. You know, a band getting together, good for the creativity, good for the, you know, the the connection between the musicians. I mean, you know, but in practicality, that can never happen for us or I can never get that amount of time or, you yeah. know, I'm a weekend warrior and, you know, this is my deal with my wife for how much time I can give to this and yeah. whatever whatever that discussion might be. But it does, it is kind of raise an interesting question about like, how often do you look at your band and think about things other than the, than the tactical stuff you got to accomplish. You got to get to the gig. You got to do the gig. You got to pack up and go home. You got to get to rehearsal. You got to, you know, ch check off all the stuff that's on rehearsal yeah. and you got to get, get home. How much do you really just think about what's good for the band? You know, what, what would make the band even more flowing, satisfying, creative endeavor? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a great question. It's, um, I mean, there's, and there's no one magic answer. It's, you no. know, what, what works for your band, but it, it's a, I love asking that question. That's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. You're giving me food for thought here. I like there it. Go. That's good. I had a, um, well, I had an interesting day Saturday and it, it culminated in a, being it up there <laughs> in an interesting gig. <laughs> Uh, which I will tell you about. The next thing that I want to tell you about, though, is our sponsor, which is Banzoogle this week. And we are happy to have Banzoogle back on board at Banzoogle.com. As I mentioned in the intro to the show, you go there, you try it out free for 30 days. And then our promo code GIGGAB gets you 15% off the first year of any subscription. Banzoogle is where you are going to host your band's online presence. And, it, you know, think of it as the place for your electronic press kit, certainly in general, your website. Banzoogle has all the features that you need. This is built by musicians for musicians, I, I, except what I, I and that's their slogan. And so I wanted to say it that way. But what I really want to say is that it's built by musicians who also know how to build websites for musicians that don't necessarily need to know how to build websites, right? Mm -hmm. Because Banzoogle is this all-in-one platform that makes it super easy for you to do this because they've done all the hard work. So 
Things like you want to use your own custom domain name? No problem. They've got that taken care of. You know, they have all these templates that they've built that they, again, the musicians that happen to be good at web design too, that work at Banzoogle have built these templates because they know how to build templates and they also know what you need as a musician for your online presence. Then in addition to these templates that you can totally customize to make your own, they have tools to sell your music, your merch, all of that's commission free. Crowdfunding and fan subscription features, guess what? Also commission free. Mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, social media integrations, and seven days a week, they offer live support from who? Their musician friendly team. And like I said earlier, because you're a Gig Gab podcast listener, you get to go to bandzoogle.com, try it free for 30 days, and then use our promo code Gig Gab, which is all one word, G I G G A B, to get 15% off your first year of any subscription. So bandzoogle.com, promo code Gig Gab, and our thanks to Bandzoogle for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. I love those guys. Just just started my second site with a Banzoogle. Nice. Template. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, they, no, they make it super House easy. Rockers, House Rocker site and my Paul Kent music site. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's great. It's good. It's easy. So Saturday, Saturday was just one of those sort of rough days. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to complain, but I'm, I'm going to acknowledge that it was just, you know, nothing that I did Saturday went terribly smoothly. That's the day that I sort of spent some time pulling together the beginnings of my travel schedule. And it was just a lot of friction and I just wasn't going well. And I missed out on a nap because of that. And then I had to go to this gig and earlier in the afternoon, uh, before I dug into all this travel stuff, I packed up my car, you know, so that I'd have the stuff that I needed, which was a little bit atypical because we were playing on a multi multi band bill. We were opening the show at this, uh, great, little dive bar down in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is about an hour away. And uh, we we were using another band's backline. So we had, you know, communicated all the things that needed to be communicated. They were great about it. They told us exactly what we had. For me, it was like drums and cymbal stands and a stool. So I should bring, uh, you know, a snare drum and cymbals. And that's really all I needed. Anybody who's listened to this show or ever met me knows that my car had far more things than that in it because you don't really ever know. Like, do I need somebody else's stool? Do I need to bring my own stool because theirs is not adjustable? Do I need my own kick drum pedal? Like all those things. So my car had all my, I put all my stuff in my car. Great. No problem. Came home a couple hours, you know, fought with all these travel plans and figured it all out and uh, made myself a little bit of dinner my wife and daughter were going to meet me at the gig. So they had actually left early. They were going to like have dinner on the way down to this place. So they're gone. And I come across the driveway to get in my car at seven o'clock. Cause we had an eight o'clock load in and I see my trunk is open. I drive a Subaru out back. I love my Subarus. We actually, we have three of them. It turns out right now, just sort of, I mean, kind of by happenstance. Um, my main complaint Really, my only complaint with Subaru is that any opportunity that car has to leave a light on and drain your battery, it will. So cool. So I see the trunk open and I'm like, here it goes again. Yep. Okay. And so I go to, you know, like close the trunk and I realize, yeah, there's no, there's very little juice left in this little beast. But you know, I'm a geek too. And I have one of these things that is like a, a battery pack for your car. That you can like clip on like jumper cables and start the car. Well, mine is dead. It doesn't seem to want to hold the charge anymore. So it couldn't start the car. There are no other cars at my house. My wife has one with her and my daughter halfway to the gig. And then the other car that we own is, you know, whatever, a, a 30 minute walk from me at my daughter's apartment on the other side of town. Okay, great. So this is cool. The clock's ticking because, you know, I was supposed to leave like right at the moment that I started trying to figure out what was going on with my car. So now we're, you know, 10, 15 minutes past that. I get on my Facebook neighborhood group and I text my message, my neighbors and see if anybody's around to come over and actually give me like a real jump. And uh, finally, uh, one of my neighbors, you know, savior, my, my neighbor, Micah Stark amazing person. He, he's like, Oh, this is great. He's like, haven't done anything productive all day. I can help you. This is going to be great. I'm like, perfect. Happy to be of service. Yeah. And so he came over and gave me a jump by seven 30. I'm on the road band obviously already knows about all this. Okay, great. 
But it's, you know, we have a nine o'clock downbeat. I'm playing on a borrowed kit. Parking at the gig is non-existent. It's street parking. So there's no like, you know, I have to get there, take the things that I think I need out of my car and then go in and figure out what I need and park my car. You know, there's all the all the things that that can sort of be extra little points of friction for a gig are still ahead of me. So I drive my hour. Thankfully, no traffic. I get to the gig. I do my little unload. I, you know, I step inside, get a feel for what's going on. I meet the other drummer. He tells me some things and he was great about, you know, this. I asked him, do you mind if I adjust the height of your stool or, or some of your stands? He's like, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, you do, do what you need to do. And I'm like, okay, thank you very much. You know? And uh, so I, I park my car, I get away to set up and all that good stuff. There are no monitors at this show. And I didn't, I had all the gear in my car, which was now a few blocks away to like wire up my own in-ears, which, which I definitely should have done and would have done if I had, you know, an hour instead of, you know, 17 minutes to get, uh, to get everything situated, but I didn't. So I was like, you know what? All right, fine. It's been a few decades, but I certainly learned how to sing harmonies without monitors aimed at me for a long time. I know how to do this. Thankfully, Bitter Pill Played, you know, umpteen gigs all summer long. We know how to sing together. I know what's going to happen. I don't necessarily need to hear the other people. It's always nice. <laughs> but, you know, things are what they are. You deal in the moment. And so, you know, I had I had a moment to pee. And then, oh, and then, my goodness, as I'm setting up, the drums are in front of a fire, like an electric fireplace in this place. And it's on. And I'm like, I, I can't, like, there's no, I'm going to be naked. Like, it's super, super freaking hot in front yeah. of this thing. And so, like, while trying to really be, like, calm and focused, because it's nobody's fault that I'm in this pressure cooker, quite literally. Y you know, it's like, I'm, I'm still, like, a little bit on edge. But, uh, okay, like, fine. It's, you know, it's just how it is. It's, nobody there caused this problem, you know. I, and I'm thankful that I'm here, all this good stuff. But, like... Trying to stay focused, trying to get things done, trying to be productive. And at every turn, I have this massive distraction of like, we have to figure out how to turn that thing off. And I'm asking people, at, you know, here and there, like, hey, is there a world where that thing doesn't you know, burn my ass while I'm playing? Is it could be maybe? And people are like, oh, yeah, of course. Sure. But nobody's doing anything about it. Like, whoa, am I asking the wrong people? Like, I didn't know who was who. I didn't know if. Someone I was talking to was a band member in the bands after us, or if they were maybe on staff at the club. I had no idea. You know, it turns out I never once asked staff at the club because it's just how it worked. And then finally, I, I I looked and I saw like this this cable running to an outlet. So I created what we in the tech industry like to call a high impedance air gap between <laughs> between the outlet and the and the plug. And sure enough. That turned off the cooker. And after we played, the other drummer came up to me and he's like, you turned off the fireplace. I'm like, oh, yeah, of course I did. He's like, thank goodness. He's like, I, don't, I couldn't imagine having to play in front of that thing. I'm like, dude, same, you know, like same. I listened back. Thing. Go ahead. The club, that, the club that we're playing in right now, for some reason, uh, they, they put a video fireplace right behind the drummer. Mm. So we walked in and here's this like, you know, 65 inch <laughs> television with a with a Yule log, the Yule log going. channel. So, so <laughs> no heat though. Right, right. Yeah, that that would be a big differentiator, uh, at least for <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah. Is what are the what's what's the what are the amount of joules that we're pushing out of this thing? But um, I, I, I don't know whatever it is. BTUs maybe is what we're pushing out of this thing. But uh, yeah, it, you, you know, and and then and we played and it felt good. It was a little weird because it literally was the first gig in decades where I haven't had anything. I, you know, I put some earplugs in, um, A, to protect my hearing, but also that does help me hear, you know, inside my head with harmonies. But I always remember, you know, you're blending a little bit weird. You're always going to hear yourself a little bit flat that way. So, okay, you know, bear that in mind. There was one moment where I, I – there's one song where Emily and I cross harmonies in it, and I had forgotten about that. I, evidently – it's not all muscle memory. It's all, you know, like there, there are things that I hear that tell me what to do. And the first chorus of that tune, which was actually not even on the set list, but it's a song we play all the song, all the time. We played it as an encore called too many vampires. And in the chorus, I sing high first and then she goes high on the last one. I come down and catch her. Um, 
I forgot that the first course. And then I heard, you know, her go, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Okay. Yep. All right. Next time around, I know what to do. And then I heard some recordings of it. And it, well, the first thing I thought of when I heard the recordings was, ah, hmm, it sounds okay. The guitar's a little loud. And, and then I thought, wait a minute, if I have that nitpick, that means our sound was amazing considering what we were working with, but even just on its own, like all the harmonies were there. The band was mostly in balance. Like it was, it was fine. Um, the, you know, especially compared to, you know, the punk bands that played after us, which did the punk thing, which meant everything was at just 11 all the way through the tunes. And, you know, vocals were sort of in the blend, you know, in the muck with, with everything else. Ours stood right out and it was like, Oh yeah, look at what we can do. Hey. So I, it was, it, it was, it was a triumphant uh, set to play. And, and it was really fun to be able to play, you know, in a, in a in sort of a dive bar like that where it was just all energy and the crowd was super into it. Most of whom did not know the band before uh, we showed up to play there, which was even better. And, and we, we entertained and, and played really, really well. So it was, it was fun. I, I would, you know, would I choose to have exactly that sort of scenario? Um, no, but, uh, you know, not, not with the, the dead battery, not with the delays, not with the fireplace, not with the no monitors, all of that stuff, but it, it sure made it fun. You know, friction creates energy, right? So absolutely. <laughs> there's a little so too much gone? energy coming off the fireplace, but you know, otherwise. Well, until, until you install the, uh, the, uh, the high gap. impedance air gap. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> so uh, you were gone last week, uh, but the House Rockers did play a club date on the Saturday before that. So the 26th of February, I guess. And uh, we're back at this club that we've been playing for years. Oh, years Charlie's, years. right? Right. And, yeah. Um, How'd that go? Well, I, it, there's, a, there's a few tales to the story that are kind of interesting. It went great. Good. Um, you, you know, to refresh your memory, you know, Charlie's, we've played for about 10 years and there've been one or two periods of time where whatever the current owner decides to stop live music for a while yeah, and then starts it up again. So, you know, our gig there was regular for a long time and then abruptly halted. And then, you know, you know, we were going to go back to the old format. And then, you know, most recently the club has sold again. Uh -huh. um, the new owner tried a different format and um, for what, for a multitude of reasons, you know, has decided to go, they even changed the name for a while. Um, now they're back to their original format of, you know, of bands and, and that type of thing. But the interesting thing about the, about that gig now, the deal is bands get a hundred percent of the door. Okay. Okay. So, so the, 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 the thumbs up part of this is a door deal, you know, basically is often saying that the owner is saying, you know, I don't want to pay for bands, but a hundred percent of the door is some, I mean, that's good. That, that's, I don't know that that's ter typical. Typical. Usually, usually when there's a door deal, the, the bar will, you know, say part of that belongs to us. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw, but, I saw a thing from, uh, Mike was in fling was talking to this place, flight coffee, which actually I actually played with bitter pill a couple times too, which, and it's a great place and you do get a hundred percent of the door there, but it's like, you get a hundred percent of the door. We pay the fees on those tickets and we provide you with sound engineer and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And, and I think that was the deal that we cut with the Stone Church for all the fling fests that we did was, you know, we got 100% of the gross of the door uh -huh. and, and, and they, you know, they staffed everything that we need, included, including an engineer and, you know, people at the door to, to handle everything. And so it was like, yeah, that's fine. Like if we know that we're going to be able to bring people in, then it's a, gr that's a great deal. I don't. I don't see the hundred percent of the door thing as, as sort of definitively bad. It obviously it can be if, if it's the wrong place for your band to play, but well, well, that's, that's actually the point, right? Yeah. So we, the house rockers have a long track record there and we knew, I knew we could do well. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You, but you, you I know, want going this place in. to be yeah. in business next month too. Right. And so, <laughs> right. you know, not every band can do it. So the, the interesting tales of this, of this story are, by definition, it is truly a partnership between the band and the venue and should be looked at as such by all parties. The 100%. band has a vested interest. If you can make bank by taking the door, you have a vested interest, if it's a good place that you want to play, of that the place succeeds. Are there, 
you know, enough bands to fill every weekend to draw enough people in where the bar does its part so the venue can continue on. Sure. Yeah, that's a good, right? that's you, a great you, question. Yeah, exactly. You, this is now a give and take. And and similarly, and that's actually one of the, one of the issues that I want to share is um, how the bar operates. It's, it's drink pricing, you know, it's, it's the quality of its bartender service. Yeah. That affects now your fan base. Right. So if your fan base is like, I love listening to you, but I can't get a drink, you know, I'm, I'll see you somewhere else. Um, that's that's going to be an issue. And so the ability for the band and the venue owner to have a meaningful discussion about what is successful. Like, for example, I think it's reasonable for the for the venue owner to say, I'm willing to take a shot on your band, but, you know, we need performance. We expect performance. And if you don't perform, we won't be able to have you back. You know, and or we expect this amount of marketing on the band side. You know, you're you're the draw, um, and then band is you know equally reasonable to say you know yes we will bring our fan base to this, but it needs to be a place our fan base wants to come. Yes. So we were the op- the grand opening weekend band for this. We packed the place. Um, a lot of a lot of pluses, a few you know things to be fixed. In general, a good experience, and we're looking forward. We you know, have four or five more dates over the next six or seven months um, booked there. But it is an interesting new reality. And it's always interesting to me when we have these discussions because the situations are different all over the country, all over the world. There are places where you know cover bars are are booming and boomed all the way through the pandemic. And you know, that life sure. went on as normal. In my area, in Northern California, there's um, not as many venues in the winter where bands can play. Very, very few. In the summer, we have this really vibrant uh, festivals and concert series circuit that is, you know, there's a lot of work there. Yeah, that's true. But in the winter. You, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But in the winter, you know, you, you're not, not a good good venues that can play. So I really want to see this venue succeed. Um, I came away from our first gig with a bunch of notes and sat down with the new owner and said, here, you know, do you want my feedback? And he said, yes, which is a good start. And, um, and then I kind of just kind of shared with him, you know, Hey, you know, the security guys were great. You know, the bar was a little bit, you know, you, you could have made more money if, if, uh, if you could have gone a little faster at the bar. And he acknowledged that, you know, in a very professional way. It's great. And so it was a good, yeah, it was a good give and take, but the premise is it's, it's be it's on both it's on the band and on the venue to look at it as a partnership. The bar will oh. not have people buying its drinks if they don't pick the right bands and if take there aren't care people, of the people in there to buy right. the drinks. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Yeah. I hundred percent agree that those kind of gigs really do have to be that kind of partnership, which is very different, in my opinion, from gigs where the the venue sort of dictates everything, you know, here's yeah. when you're going to, here's when you're going to play. Here's how much we're going to pay you. Here's all this. It's like, okay, then that's like, you've got it all figured out. We'll be there when you tell us to be there. Like we're good. And, and we're going to deliver. And write, write the check. Yeah. And please write the check. Yeah, exactly. That it, it is a different, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a halfway step between what, what we call on the show for walling your own event where you rent a club and, you know, rent yes. a room and just like do it. And that, there's also nothing wrong with that. But as you might imagine, if you do a little bit of the calculus there, that's 100% risk on you, the band, right? If you're renting a club, well, all the and proceeds work, come to you. you know? Right, but it's a lot yeah. of work. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so you're right. This is this is on the way to that. Here's a good example of give and take. So as we book the dates out into the future, um, our uh, it's that same model where the bands play from like 7 to 10 or 10.30, and then a DJ immediately steps in and there's kind of a changeover in the crowd that goes until 1.30 or 2. These are classic rock bands or classic, you know, funk bands. They're, you know, kind of playing 60s, 70s, 80s material, largely, you know, a little bit of an older crowd. And so I think that's a pretty good model. However, when uh, daylight saving time kicks in and it doesn't, it's not dark at 7 anymore. That's this weekend, nobody, folks, just for those right. of you keeping track at home and even for right. those of you who aren't. So I made a very impassioned appeal, appeal that said, you know, as we move past daylight savings time, I will not be able to sell tickets for people to come in. They won't come in while it's broad daylight out and they won't be dancing until, you know, at least gets dusky, right? Yeah. And so, you know, let's move the time schedule and that means moving your DJ schedule and all these types of things. And, you know, the, the venue owner astutely is like, well, 
I know that uh, the younger demographic buys more booze than the older demographic. So if you're going to eat into an hour of that, you know, we have to have a conversation about what that means. So, and that's all in the give and take, right? That's yeah, all. Yeah, no, because yeah, they discussion. know things you don't know, and they see things from their perspective. And like you said, if you can share that data back and forth, then it, that's that's the path to creating a win win win, right? It's it's and not a zero sum. It's not a zero sum game. Yeah, that's right. That's very true. Yeah. And the temptation when communication is bad for everybody to silo themselves and say, listen, I'm not going to be able to accomplish anything with this guy, so I'm just going to take care of myself. <laughs> that's understandable, but short-term thinking. Right. Yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that I, I like it. I'm glad. Well, I'm glad that the, the gig worked out, and I'm even more glad that you've got this conversation happening with the you know the 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 new management there or the management that's that's in charge now that's yeah. that's great i like it yeah that's good that's good where do we go so yeah 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 these 100 percent of the door gigs are not a bad thing we've had in fact quite a few of them with bitter pill uh this past year and they have been fantastic and i you know i mean and i mentioned that we did that with the stone church too and of course that was all pre-pandemic with those fling fests we did there. The same was true when we did a fling fest at the Rochester Opera House, the very first of them. It was all, they were all these 100% of the door gigs and uh, they always did well for us. But we knew that we could bring people in. In fact, that was the whole issue with fling fest is we were trying to talk to clubs that were operating under the, you know, we decide all and we tell you how much you're going to make and we tell you when you're going to start and all that model. And we were like, yeah, but for those, because of where we were, as the five of us in fling with our family sort of evolution. And that meant our friends and their kids were at the same place. We're like, no, 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 we, we want to start at 7 PM. Like that's the time seven to right. 10 is the sweet spot for these sweet particular spot. fling fests. Exactly. And most of these clubs are like, well, people are eating at seven. We don't want music at seven. And it's like, okay, well, I'm telling you, we'll, we will fill your place. And they're like, yeah, no. And so that's why we wound up doing the Rochester Opera House because it, it you know, it's a, just an open room. I mean, it's yeah. it's, a, it's an opera house. And we brought, it wasn't quite 300 people in there for the first one, but it was, you know, over 250. That's and, a win. And it was a huge win. Yeah. And even, I, even there, some people that came were like, you know, I came to this, but I didn't think it was going to work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, it, yeah. I, it, we knew. Like, it was hard not to be super like snarky about it. Cause it was like, yeah, we, we were a hundred percent certain this, that this was going to yeah. work. And, and then clubs, the clubs that all said no to us started calling. They're like, Hey, we heard that that worked. Would you like to do it here? We're like, I don't think so. I don't think your room is the right room for it. And it wasn't, again, that wasn't a F you because you said, no, it was, we learned a little something and we were glad we didn't try it there because that place wouldn't have been right. And then obviously the stone church at the time with that management uh, was focused on things in a way that that was perfectly aligned with what we were focused on uh, with Fling. And and then the, the booking changed and eventually the management changed, but the booking changed and they were focused on different stuff. And it was like, okay, yeah, this isn't a, a fit anymore. And that was okay. It, you know, it's just like, but it, we had a good long run with those things and they were all 100% door gigs. We wound up trying to think what we did with them. There were a couple of them that we did for charity for sure. Um but a lot of times we made sure like the kid bands that we, that we'd have open for us or whatever, got a nice payday out of it and yeah, you know, yeah. things like that. But, but you know, it was, it was all hundred percent door it was, and it was great. It, like, you know, it can be there, great. there are three, uh, holy wars in, in, in the world of cover bands, right? <laughs> One is cargo shorts. Two okay. is all right. iPad, iPads on stage. Sure. And three is, is it, is it the venue's responsibility or the band's responsibility you know, to draw the crowd. Right. I, sure. I, and this, this is that third one. And, and I, I see vociferous staunch positions that are like, I provide the entertainment. It's right. your bar. You know, you figure out how to, how to fill it. I, you know, I'm there to entertain those people. That's right. Which people are, then there's many people who have that very specific right. opinion. I mean, I am, I am very much in that camp as long as that's what the gig is. Right. Like, they, like, well, like a, like a hundred percent door gig, not that like, this is our idea. We're doing a thing. We're partnering, partnering with the venue to make it work. Great. But if the venue is just hiring us, then, okay. Then it's, especially if you're just playing a cover band, like why would you be the draw? I, I'm not the draw at a wedding. 
I'll tell you why. (laughs) There there is an answer. You're right. You know, wedding bands are about a qualitative experience. and, And it's not, you're not a wedding band based upon your ability to draw because you don't have any control over that. It's not wedding, your, right? it's not your but, rodeo. Yeah. But, and I, as I've always said is why don't you want to, to draw an audience? Like why you, you, it opens up so many more opportunities. Like, Hey, why do you want to be a musician? If you don't have fans, I, I guess that would be one of the questions I would ask. Right. Number two, if you're going to go to the effort of getting people to emotionally connect to your music, why don't you want them to, follow you and, and go where you go. And then if you do that, you know, you create so many more opportunities. You can create hundred percent of the door deals where one didn't exist sure. before. You can four world where the things didn't exist before. You can command more money or, you know, cause you're going to, you know, be a better draw for, for a venue or something like that. So I don't, I don't, I don't understand if you're a publicly performing group, why you would be settled into the position that it's not my job you know, to bring fans. If you do your job well, you're going to bring fans. I mean, if you cultivate a fan base. I was just right? going to say that that's very different than playing music, right? And that's probably worth a whole other episode uh, or at least another segment of discussion because because there's two, those are two very, very different things, right? And I, So maybe we should put a pin in this because the answer to <laughs> why would you – well, because it's it, like we, we could go, you know, 20, 30 minutes on this. Like why would you want to be – so I, I want to leave it open. I want to hear from you folks, and, and then we'll talk about this next week. But your question, why would you want to be a musician if you don't have fans – I think there are valid answers to either side. I don't think I, I know you meant it rhetorically, but but I think that's a, that's actually a fantastic question to answer. Why would you want to be a publicly performing musician? Uh, I mean, but that's I not what you said. I, I know. I get it. I, I, that's it, what I'm saying. If you're going to put yourself out there on a stage where people can see you, yeah. Why wouldn't you want to? Yeah, but even even then, the mind? like even even with that, you know, edit to the question. I, like I still think that there's a fantastic answer to that. And, and so I, like, I think, I think that's a good, um, that's a good segue into, into next week. (laughs) I think it's, I think it's good. It gives me a lot to think about, but we want to hear what you have to say too. feedback at giggabpodcast.com because, uh, this is your conversation too. So, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, I saw, um, our buddy Dan, you know, had a, had a comment about a product that he uses and likes. And, and, uh, it's funny that you put it in the notes for us to cover today because, well, I'll let you talk about Dan's position and let me add something to it. I sure. Well, we were talking about uh, mic stands and I, I said that, you know, I was I was using the ultimate stands and they fall apart and, you know, their lifetime warranty is a weird thing. Uh, and, and Dan wrote in and he's like, oh, guys, absolutely. He says for him now, K&M mic stands uh, are the only thing to use if they go on a stage. Very different from, you know, like I was talking about here in the rehearsal room. You set them up once, leave them. Mic stands might last, you know, hundred years. Start breaking them down, throwing them in gig bags, p- pulling them back and forth, tearing them down, setting them up on stage. You need stuff that's reliable. Dan really likes the K and M stands. He says, uh, "Accept no substitutes." Uh, worth every penny every time. And his accept no substitutes has a caveat that says, or a, a, a supporting statement which says, especially since Hercules stands went to KHS quality tanks. So yeah, K and M stands. Mm-hmm. I I I. So- Yeah, those are good stands. I don't own any, but I probably should, especially after fighting with my uh, ultimate stand. Again, I mentioned many friction points uh, at my gig on Saturday. One point that did not have enough friction was the uh, wing nut that closes the boom arm of my ultimate stand down. So my microphone, thankfully, I have my vocal mic on uh, on a gooseneck, so the it it uh, it kind of comes and hangs down right in front of me. I have the the stand go over at a ninety degree angle, and then the thing hangs down. Thank goodness for that, because the hanging down is what kept it in place. It was just free swinging because there wasn't enough friction there. So I'm done with that crap for now. I feel you. So I, let me just plus one Dan's opinion about K and M. I own a K and M uh, stool, for, you know, for my solo acoustic. Oh games, yeah, right? sure, yeah. Awesome. Just an incredibly, wonderfully engineered, sturdy, comfortable, you know, it, but it was also the most expensive uh, <laughs> stool out there. Interestingly, 
Um, and I assume that you know K and M, a German company, that their you know that their engineering is awesome, but they're going to be always premium pricing for everything. I just bought a K and M harmonica holder, which was like twenty two dollars or something like that, and it's the best harmonica holder I've ever had. So I mean, they they I I don't know how they market test their price points for everything. They're not the highest in everything. I don't know where they are in mic stands, but they were the most expensive stool. But I freaking love that stool, and I had to replace one of the stoppers on the stool, one of the foot foot grabs. And uh, they were the service was great. They're, they had a distributor in the East Coast, and took care Sweet. of me right away. But you know, I I now have formed the opinion between Dan's perspective, my love for my stool, and now my harmonica holder. K and M stuff is going to be really top quality all the time. Okay, well done, That's great, well yeah, done, K and M. I got I got to I got to add one of those to my to my shopping cart. Really, is what it is because I just can't sure. deal with this freaking ultimate thing. It's supposed to be a lifetime warranty. <laughs> stupid anyway i i don't i actually don't care what the warranty is anymore i need something that's reliable because unless they have somebody in a truck outside of every gig i play the warranty becomes far less valuable to me sure in the moment yeah sure sure yeah yeah maybe i have an opinion about this i don't know i, I believe you do i think i do <laughs> All right. Well, again, we want to hear your opinion on why would you want to be a musician, a publicly performing one or otherwise, if you don't have fans or if you don't try to cultivate fans. Yeah, this is I, I like I love this conversation. This is good. Cool. Is that what we have for today? Are we good? We're good, man. Welcome right. back. Glad you had a nice time. Thanks. And yeah. uh, hope spring springs for you pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's springing here. It's it's good. We're we're moving in the right direction. We're moving in the predicted direction. It's all. It's all good. We might have another snowstorm because, you know, I live in New Hampshire. That's how that works. We've had <laughs> we've had snow in early April before. So, you know, it could happen. But um, but I'm going to be on the road for like 11 days with uh, South by because South by is in Austin next week. Uh, and then the following the end of the following week is podcast movement out in Los Angeles. So I figured it I, it does not make sense for me to travel home halfway back across the country from Austin and then two days later travel all the way across the country to LA. So I'm just going to go West from Austin and, and be out West for a few days early. My son and, and wife are going to come down and um, join me and we'll hang for a couple of days and then they can hang while I have to go to this conference. So all good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you for hanging out with us again. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And we look forward to hanging out with you next week. You can hang out with us, though, in the interim. If you go to giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook in our Facebook group, where we're always kind of talking about this stuff. So there you go. What's the deal there, Paul? What, what, what's the rule? It would be uh, always be performing. <laughs> <laughs>